Well, hello everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you virtually. It'd be much more fun to be there in person, but... That's true. Yeah. Oh, well, here we are. And uh, this concert that we're going to present to you is uh, going to be piecemeal. We recorded the, um, the pieces back in the springtime, and you'll notice a big difference between Fred's demeanor there and, uh, and here. He's got his COVID coiffure, uh, and uh, it's growing it for the winter, I guess, to keep him warm. <laughs> well, I was due for my haircut just before the tour, and I missed it. Yes, never mind. So here we are, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for welcoming us into your community. The music that we have always done has been folk music, primarily from the British Isles, Ireland and Scotland, and the New England, where we're from. We're here in our home in Maine, Round Pond, Maine. And uh, we've been looking at the songs that were collected here in Maine in the early 20th century. Uh, some of you may know that uh, Francis Child collected songs in the mountains in the late 19th century. Well, it turns out there were collectors here in Maine. And going through our repertoire, we realized that several of the songs actually came through Fred's family. So uh, he's going to tell you about that. Yeah, I, my mother's family came down from New Brunswick in 1922 and brought with them the songs that the men had learned in the logging camps. And of course, the women had their own set of songs. And there was some crossover. My Mother learned some songs from my grandfather that my grandmother was scandalized about. <laughs> we won't sing those. <laughs> but the logging camps were full of singing uh, as entertainment. Um, interestingly, the recordings that we've been listening to are all a cappella. There's no instruments, there's no fiddles, there's no guitars, there's no piano. Certainly no harps. No, no, certainly not. So we've taken these songs, which were collected uh, by a number of different collectors. Uh, there's over 3,000 songs collected in the Northeast. 900 of them are from Maine. That's just in one collection. That's just one collection. But um, in any case, we've taken these a cappella songs, and as Robert Burns would say, Scottish poet Robert Burns, he said he mended the songs. And a lot of people don't know that he, in fact, was collecting songs in Scotland in the uh, 18th century with the same purpose of helping them to live beyond his lifetime. So um, he mended them and made them uh, more appropriate for the, the audience of the time. Some of these songs have missing lines or missing verses. Um, none of them had any instrumental accompaniment. So some of the reconstruction and all of the arrangements are our own. Right. So, just to, so that we found something manageable, we decided to focus on the maritime songs for starters. So this concert this evening is all songs of the sea and sailors. And the first song that we're going to sing you is called The Green Bed. Now, in a tavern in the old days, there was a special room called The Green Bed, reserved for those people of means or people who were favored by the landlord. And this is one of those songs of which there are dozens or maybe hundreds of the sailor goes to sea to make his fortune and leads his girlfriend ashore and the song takes up when he comes back to find out how she has been doing in his absence. <laughs> so here's the green bed. It's of a young sea captain who had lately gone ashore. He went up to an alehouse where he had been before. You are welcome home, young Johnny. You are welcome home from sea. Last night. I lost my ship and cargo all on the raging sea. All along the white Atlantic, my ship and cargo crossed. All on the white Atlantic, my ship and cargo lost. But bring down pretty Polly on 
set her on my knee. Yes, bring down pretty Polly, and married we will be. My daughter, she is absent, oh, she has gone away. And if she were at home, John, she would not let you stay. Now when John, he heard this, oh, he hung down his head. He called for a candle to light him to bed. This next song is another sailor and girl on shore song. This one, this time the sailor comes back and he has pockets full of gold, of course. Pockets full of gold. Always pockets full of gold. Um, he's called the tarry sailor because he has tar in his hair. Why did he have tar in his hair? Well, the British sailors wore tar in their hair to keep it out of their eyes. Uh, the American sailors had crew cuts. So... The so he's a tarry sailor, we know he's from a British sailor, and he could have had pockets full of gold because if he was in the Navy and had signed the ship's articles, he was entitled to a share of any captures they made. It was possible for a common sailor to come ashore with 500 or 1,000 pounds, mm. which in those days was a lot of money. Right. So in this case, the father wants to make sure that he's going to take care of his daughter. So this is the Tari Sailor. Quickly, yes or no, will you win? 
with a diary sailor. When her old father was standing by, and that Jack was a cocky, he said, Young man, you might as well be gone as to stand here. I be talking for my daughter, she is far too young, and the sailor has a flattering tongue, so quit my presence and be gone, she'll not win with a tiring sailor. So many of these songs are based on history or experience and um, they get passed down through generations because they reflect an experience that was important to the people. This one is pretty interesting because we have found a local story that actually uh, is parallel to the song. The song was not made about the story but it seems that this experience must have been fairly common because the song became popular. Well, in 1753, a fellow named Alexander Fawcett in Northern Ireland was enamored of Miss Young. Ooh. And her parents did not like Mr. Fawcett and consequently sent her from Ireland across here to Maine to her uncle's house in Pemaquid, which is like eight miles from where we live. Mr. Young was not to be dissuaded. He, he joined a cattle boat, worked his way across to Philadelphia, and then up the coast, and one night sang beneath her window. Oh. So says our local history. Right. And um, his suit must have been successful because there are faucets in the town to this very day. Goodness. So this song is called If I Were a Blackbird. It has a lovely chorus, and you're welcome to sing it. We can't hear you, but you could sing it. If I were a blackbird, I'd whistle and sing. I'd follow the vessel my true love sails in. I'd fly to the topmast and there build my nest and sing a sweet song to the one I love best. The Blackbird. One I love best. 
I crossed o'er the ocean my fortune to seek Though I missed her caress and her kiss on my cheek I returned and I told her my love was still warm But she tearfully told me I would soon be forlorn And if I were a blackbird I whistle and sing I fly to the vessel my true love sails in I light on the topmast and there build my nest And sing a sweet song to the one I love best I promised I'd take her to the Donnybrook Fair And buy her fine ribbons to tie up her hair I promised I'd tarry and stay by her side But she said in the morning she sailed with the tide And if I were a blackbird I'd whistle and sing I'd fly to the vessel my true love sails in I'd light on the topmast and here build my nest And sing a sweet song to the one I love best Oh, if I were a writer and could handle the pen One long loving letter to my true love I'd send I'd tell of my sorrow, my grief and my pain Since she has left me and sailed o'er to me And if I were a blackbird I'd whistle and sing I'd fly to the vessel my true love sails in I'd light on the topmast and air build my nest and sing a sweet song to the one I love best. Now her parents, they chide me, they do not agree, saying me and my true love Mary never shall be. Well, let them deprive me, let them do what they will while there's breath. In my body, she's my true love still. And if I were a blackbird, I'd whistle and sing. I'd fly to the vessel my true love sails in. I'd light on the topmast and then build my nest. And sing a sweet song to the one I love best. Yes, I'd sing a sweet song. Well, here's another song that parallels a local story. Yes, the story actually takes place in Dresden, Maine, on the Kennebec River, and it appears in the history of Dresden. In the story, the beautiful young woman of the village marries the handsome young sea captain, and uh, he unfortunately has to leave uh, to seek his fortune. So he leaves his bride behind. One night, she has a terrible dream. She imagines <clears throat> that his... His ship sails up the Kennebec, and the gangplank drops down. He comes to the end of the gangplank, and he says, Prepare to follow me. Oh, my. And this disturbed her so much that she told her family and friends. Um, subsequently, she began to, to wa waste away and finally died. And then they discovered that his ship had actually uh, been lost in a storm with all hands. Nobody survived. So interestingly, the song was made previous to that in the in 1700s in Scotland, but it reflects that story of the young bride dreaming of her drowned husband. It's called Mary's Dream. The moon had climbed hill that rises o'er the river deep, and from her eastern summit shed her silvery light on field and tree, when Mary laid 
This next song is from that group of songs where the woman disguises herself and goes to sea. Uh, in many cases, she's following her lover. In this case, he has already been drowned in some foreign sea, according to the song. She becomes a sailor because she wants to be a sailor, and she's a good sailor, but she gets a little overconfident and suffers the consequences. It's interesting because in the song it mentions her name, and the whole event, and, uh, and we've tracked it to a newspaper article in London uh, which described this very event. It's called The Rambling Female Sailor. There's only four verses, so we've extended it with a tune that was a Morris dancing tune, an English Morris dancing tune. 
very similar to the one that the song is set to, called The Rambling Female Sailor. there's always the sirens, the mermaids, who can be deadly for the sailors. And you probably know the song that the, um, the Kingston Trio sang about the mermaid. That's a very jolly song. And Yippee, we're I all going to drown. I never could get into that. So it was really interesting to find this main version of the song called The Gallant Ship, which in fact we've traced to Scotland. And it's a much more sober kind of song. Um, the one really wonderful thing is that we were looking for information about the singer, who was only identified as Mrs. James McGill. And that's not her name, that's her husband's name. So we decided to go to her hometown, which is right on the uh, New Brunswick border. Yes, and, and we had called ahead to the historical society there and had an appointment. So we showed up and, and um, said, well, what is it you want to know? She says, well, there's this Mrs. James McGill that was a wonderful singer back in the 1920s. 
and we'd like to find out more about her. So she said, we, we have to go to a different building. So we followed her down the street into a residential area. And so then we went up onto the porch of a house and she said, what was it again that you wanted to know? We wanted to know her name. She said, well, her name was Margaret and this is her daughter, Betty. And she opened the door and there was Margaret's daughter, Betty, who was in her late 80s and was so pleased that we would be interested in her mother's songs. Unfortunately, we didn't bring our own recording equipment. We only had a notebook, but we took down some wonderful stories that Betty told us about her mother and the songs that she sang. So this song is called The Gallant Ship. There's another, another thing about this song is that uh, Julia mentioned that it came from Scotland. Well, most of the song in Scotland had been lost and all that was left was a children's playground rhyme. So we were able to take the ship back to our colleagues the in song. Scotland. The, the, so the song <laughs> back to our colleagues in Scotland. We, we had a wonderful tour of Scotland and we brought the song with us and actually taught it to the kids back there. So it's, it's made a full circle. The Gallant Ship.
Enough about mermaids. How about the mermen? The mermen. Well, in fact, I did find a song about a merman. And it was sung by Annie Tate Moore in uh, uh, West Goldsboro. And I love this because so many of the songs that we're listening to are really difficult to decipher. The equipment that they were made on was, was really um, archaic. And some of, the, some of the details are hard to hear. But in this case, this woman sang right out. She was obviously enjoying herself. And it is a song about a merman. And I've only found one other version of it, which appeared in a, a hiking uh, songbook from California, which seemed kind of odd. But I was able to put to some more verses to it. And so um, we mended it. And this is uh, Blow You Winds Hi Ho, or The Merman. Another chorus. Yes, do sing the chorus. Blow you winds high ho, blow you winds high ho, clear away the morning dew, blow you winds high ho. It was on the 4th of January, down in the southern seas, our ship lay a dagger on a big coral reef, waiting for a breeze, and the captain he was down below, the sailors they were Suddenly from under our bow A jolly little voice piped out Singing, blow, blow your winds I o Blow your winds I o Clear away the morning dew Now blow your winds I o There's a man overboard Our watch cried out So it's forward we hold it go Our captain stood on the starboard side And gazed at the water below And there he saw to do in these, in these songs is try and either find an actual historical event or some clue in the song as to the when it might have started or when it might have dated from. And in this case, the plot of the song revolves around body snatching. 
<laughs> it was so amazing to find this song. We both sat there and just laughed because it's such an unusual song, Body Snatching. But it is about sailors. Yes, it is about sailors. And in this case, the black cook, who is the smartest in the crew, he's the one that figures out how to get some more money for some more booze. So we think the song could have been made before 1832, which was when Parliament passed the Anatomy Act, making it legal to obtain cadavers for research. Before that, if you wanted to get a cadaver for research, you had to, um, to make sure that it was a body of a heinous criminal and that it had not ever received last rites. It was very, very difficult. So there were, was a, a market for bodies um, that was uh, uh, undercover, if you will, and this couple named Burke and Hare were made quite a business digging up bodies. Now, an interesting detail is that it was legal to steal a body, but not the grave goods. So these guys would dig up the body and leave the jewelry and the, cl the clothing because that was illegal, but they would um, take the body to the, uh, the university. They weren't very popular with the um, aggrieved relatives of the bodies they snatched. <laughs> and eventually they became impatient, waiting for people to die, and started creating their yep. own bodies, yes. uh, which is what got them into trouble. Right. So um, the, uh, the market in bodies is the thing to remember in this song, and it's just hilarious. So this is called The Black Cook. Come all jolly sailors, I pray pay attention Concerning a doctor who lived in Cork Town Who by some young seamen was duly outwitted And fifty bright guineas he had to pay down There were some jolly tars with their comrades a-grogging Their money being spent and their credit far gone From Wexford Street down to the docks they had wandered Saying that they were bound to have whiskey or fun now the cook of our ship was a stout able fellow, a stout able fellow, his color was black. For wit and for wisdom he always was ready to find a receipt and get all the change back. He said, my brave boys, I have heard people saying, a corpse can be sold quite readily here. So take me alive, wrap me up in me havoc, and sell me to buy us the whiskey and beer. Now the sailors were glad to accept of his offer and steered to the house where the doctor did dwell. And into his ear they did whisper so gently, say, Doctor, we have a fine corpse for to sell. Fine corpse, cried the doctor like one in amazement. Oh, where did you get him? Come tell to me, pray. If you bring him here, I will buy him quite ready, and fifty bright guineas to you I will pay. Well, the sailors were glad to accept of his offer, and back to the ship they so boldly did steer. If you pay attention to what I now mention, the best of my story you quickly shall hear. They took the black cook, wrapped him up in his hammock, he being a fellow both sturdy and strong. And under his coat, by the way of protection, they placed a large knife about half a yard long. Now midnight came on, and the streets being empty, the sailors set out with a cook on their back. When they came to the house where the doctor resided, it's in a back room they concealed the poor black. The doctor, he paid down the sailors their money, they told him the cook, he had died well at sea. And rather than have his dead body to bury, we've sold him to you, now he's out of our way. Well, the doctor went up for his tools to dissect him and quickly came back with a saw in his hand. But when he stepped up with his tools to dissect him, the black with his cut slash before him did stand. The doctor was forced to retreat in a hurry and soon of his bargain began to lament. The cookie went off with his comrades a-grogging. The rest of the evening was merrily spent.
this next song is about a very local hero. Um, he, his house was about 10 miles from where we live, and the action described in the song is about 10 miles in the other direction from where we live. So this Samuel Tucker was a hero in the Revolutionary War and retired to our local town of Bremen uh, when he was 67 years old. He had captured 45 ships in the Revolutionary War and done pretty well for himself, but unfortunately fell on hard times in his home in Beacon Hill and escaped to Maine. So, <clears throat> Maine in the War of 1812, the coast was were divided roughly into thirds. The eastern third the British had well in hand. The western third the Americans had well in hand. But where we live in the mid-coast was zone debatable. There was a lot of action locally in the War of 1812. And the British privateers in particular were raising havoc with the fishermen and trade. They were even coming ashore and milking the cows and stealing the milk. And of course they were impressing young men, which was one of the drivers for the war in the first place. They took them off to serve on British ships, leaving the, the women destitute. So there was a, a, real, um, a real kerfuffle about uh, all of this, and the locals decided to take it in their own hands. You can imagine the fishermen sitting around the co-op saying, My goodness, fellows, we heavens, must do something about heavens, this situation. We must, or words to that words effect. Words to that effect, yes. We're told that um, Samuel Tucker was pretty colorful in his language, and I'm sure that there was some drinking going on. Every, every, every written record about Tucker doesn't fail to mention his colorful language. <laughs> So the guys got together to take on the British. So they took a sloop, the increase. Of course, it was, it was not a warship. So they took the sloop and they sailed around Pemblewood Point to Booth Bay and picked up some more volunteers. And then they sailed up to the fort at Edgecombe to borrow some cannon because they didn't have any. Oh, may I borrow your cannon for the afternoon? And then they set off looking for the British privateers. They were looking for one called the Bream. And after three days, they hadn't found it, and supplies were running low. Supplies. In, the, in our research, supplies basically means rum. Rum. That's true. So they, Refreshments. They took, the, <laughs> they took the cannon back to Edgecombe, and they took the Booth Bay boys back to Booth Bay, and then they had to sail unarmed around Pembroke Point and up into Muscongas Bay. Well, right outside of Long Cove, on the east side of, of Pembroke Point, they encountered a British privateer. A battle ensued. And, uh, In the song, it's much more dramatic than the actual event. What actually happened was Tucker had his guys hide, and then he maneuvered his boat so it looked like he was trying to escape. And when the British came after him, he came around, stole their wind, and up popped his men. There was one round of small arms fire. The only casualty was the British captain's hat. And then... They took the ship, they captured the crew, sent them to the jail in West Cassett. There's one detail that wasn't in the song. We found this song, by the way, in a biography in, yes, of, of it, Tucker. Yes, at the very end of the biography, this appears these lyrics. Written by a citizen of Bristol. Right. And there was no music, so we used a tune that was popular at the time. But there was a detail in the story that doesn't appear in that transcription. It's a local legend about a fellow named Peter Collimore, otherwise known as the Bremen Giant. And he was a great, huge man with dark beard and dark hair. And allegedly... He had a kedge anchor on his shoulder that was on the bowsprit to use it as a grappling hook. So he took the anchor and, and was wielding it over his head. Shall I heave now, Captain? He was was her reported words. So. Right. And the British captain was heard to say, I thought the devil himself was after me. We thought he ought to be in the song, so we added that verse. So this is the captain capture of the crown. Enjoy that. On the 26th of April, or so it does appear, the brave boys of Bristol fitted out to privateer in command of Captain Tucker a sloop both neat and trim, and we set out to sail the seas all four to take the bream. So cheer up, me lively lads, and never be it said, 
The brave boys of Bristol were ever yet afraid. We cruised the seas for several days, but nothing did appear. So at length a bold commander resolved to homeward steer. It was on a Friday morning, and clear was the sky. Then as we were returning, a sail we did espy. So, so cheer, cheer up, up me lively lads, and never be it said. The brave boys of Bristol were ever yet afraid. Then up spoke our bold commander, and unto us did say, My boys, be all proud-hearted, and do not fail today, for our enemies before us, and after her will run, for I'm resolved to take her before the setting sun. So cheer up, me lively lads, and never be it said. The brave boys of Bristol were ever yet afraid, so we bore away after her, and after her we run. We lowered down our topsail, and we gave to her a gun. It was broadside to broadside, we showed him Yankee play, till our enemy got frightened and tried to run away. So cheer up, me lively lads, and never be it said. The brave boys of Bristol were ever yet afraid. We shot away her halyards and down her mainsail come. We drove them from their quarters and down below they run. The captain, he stepped forward, a waving of his hand. He said, I must surrender this, I can no longer stand. So cheer up, me lively lads, and never be it said. The brave boys of Bristol were ever yet afraid. We went to bind her to our lee, but much to our chagrin. We found we had no grappling hook to seize and pull her in. Till Colomore stepped up and swung the anchor o'er his head. Captain, shall I let her fly? The Bremen monster said. So cheer up, me lively lads, and never be it said. The brave boys of Bristol were ever yet afraid. We lowered a boat over and on board of her did go. We made them all our prisoners and sent them down below. We heisted Yankee colors and hauled the British down. Then when we did examine her, she proved to be the crown. So cheer up, me lively lads, and never be it said. The brave boys of Bristol were ever yet afraid. Then up spoke our bold commander, we will take our prize on shore. For we're the boys that fear no noise, though cannon loudly roar. And we will quickly rid the coast of all these British boys. For we will fight them till we die, and never mind their noise. So cheer up, me lively lads, and never be it said. The brave boys of Bristol were ever yet afraid. So we have fought that privateer till she was overcome. God bless Captain Tucker on this day for what he's done. Likewise the officers and all the jolly crew. God grant that they may prosper in everything they do. So cheer up, me lively lads, and never be it said. The brave boys of Bristol were ever yet afraid. Well, here's a song that Julia found about the search for Lord Franklin. John Franklin was one of the many explorers who were looking for the Northwest Passage. I was just looking today at a book uh, written by James Jocelyn, which was published in the 1670s, and by that time there had already been dozens of people looking for the Northwest well, Passage. Well, Hudson, I mean, that's why it's called Hudson Bay, right? Because Hudson was looking also for the, the Northwest Passage to get more easily to uh, the Pacific Ocean rather than having to go all the way down around Cape Horn. Um, it, they never really found this passage, although recently I guess the ice has melted enough that there is a Northwest Passage. But many ships went and many ships failed and this particular expedition was, um, was financed by the Crown to try and find this passage. And so John Franklin took two ships uh, into the Northwest uh, Passage and never returned. Now his wife was was distraught and she put up a, a large amount of money to, to finance uh, someone to search for him and in fact there was a poetry contest to help raise money to find Franklin and during this process of the, the poetry contest many songs were written this particular song, we think, was actually made by herself. 
Franklin's wife. Uh, it's quite elegant, and this main version of it has some details in it that we don't find in some of the Scottish versions. Um, so this song is, is a beautiful, poignant portrait of, of Franklin's wife waiting for him. Now interestingly, just a little sidebar, uh, recently the, the ships were found up in, uh, in Baffin Bay. And one reason they found them was because someone had the great idea of, of looking at the Inuit tradition and interviewing some of them about what they might know. And in fact, the Inuit did know where the ships were, and they guided the archaeologists to find them recently, within the last five years. There's some wonderful um, videos and uh, websites dedicated to the search for Franklin. This is called The Fate of Franklin. A sailor bold and undaunted stood As waves rolled over the briny flood Come pay attention to what I say Twill put you in mind of a sailor dream. We were homeward bound one night on the deep, when in my hammock I fell asleep. I dreamt a dream that I thought was true, concerning Franklin and his bold
Well, we hope you enjoyed these songs. We certainly enjoyed making them or learning them. Interpreting. Interpreting them, that's yeah. the word. Mending them. And do remember that uh, the original songs were a cappella. There were no instruments. These were simply sung by people in their living rooms or in the woods camps or the fish houses. Um, and they were just songs that people sang for one another on dark winter nights or or when the, the labor was getting uh, difficult, they would entertain one another with these songs. We've interpreted them with our own instruments and uh, to pass them on to you. And in fact, I've written a book uh, of transcriptions of these songs. We've listened to the songs and, and um, added verses where they needed to be added from other versions, um, included the history in, in these, uh, these transcriptions so that people can understand the context of the songs, hoping that they will in fact live beyond us. It's amazing that, that there are songs that were collected in Maine in the 1940s about shipwrecks in Ireland that happened in the 1820s. Well, and in fact there are several songs that we can date back to the 1600s. So these are, are timeless songs of human experience, um, and there will be other, other uh, editions with perhaps farming songs or or other songs of, of different uh, activities, but this first one is called uh, Songs of Maine and the Sailors, and so we hope that you'll enjoy that uh, when it comes out. Um, we, if you stay in touch with us at um, castlebay.net, our email is castlebay at castlebay.net. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to correspond with you. If you have any questions about any of the songs it's heard right. tonight, um, feel free to contact us. That's right, and we hope that we'll see you sometime live down the road. But until then, thank you so much for inviting us into your community, and we hope you enjoyed these songs. This last one has a, a really interesting history. It's about a ship called the Dreadnought. The Dreadnought was built in Newburyport, Massachusetts, not too far from where the source for this song lived in, in York, Maine. So, the Dreadnought was built under the direction of her captain, Samuel Samuels, whose mother apparently had no imagination. And Samuels was re reported to have said he would sail his ship and himself to fame, or he would sail them under. Jeez, I don't know if I'd want to go with a guy like that. He did sail from New York to Liverpool in nine days and 17 hours at one point around 1853. That was the record. A record that stood until the Red Jacket, I think. That's right. Fast ship. And these fast ships were uh, really becoming popular to move goods and people back and forth from the British Isles to New York and the East Coast here. Now this song, we have corresponded and picked the brains of other maritime music types and this is the only version anybody knows of where the ship is sailing eastward. All of the other versions, she's sailing westward. Which makes no sense because the record run was from New York to Liverpool and the ship was sailing east. So we think this version may in fact be the original version of this song. It's called the Dreadnought. It's got a great chorus, bound away, bound away, where the stormy winds blow, Bound away in the dreadnought, to the eastward we go. Sing it with us. Thank you so much. Bound away, bound away, where the stormy winds blow. Bound away in the dreadnought, to the eastward we go. The day of our sailing is fast growing high, and you, my dear sweetheart, I'll pick you would find. Good luck to me. All my friends here bound away in the dreadnought to the east and we still bound away, bound away, where the stormy winds blow, bound away in the dreadnought to the east and we go. And now we are hauling off the Long Island shore, our captains on deck as often before, they crowd on all sail boys and let her run free, for the dreadnought is a clipper and the sea. Bound away, bound away, where the stormy winds blow. Bound away in the dreadnought to the east and we go. And now we are 
sailing off the shore of Newfoundland Where the waters change colour and the bottom is sand Where the fish of the ocean swim about to and fro Bound away in the dreadnought to the eastern we go Bound away, bound away Now we are sailing on the ocean so wide Where the mighty blue billows rush against our dark side Our sails neatly trim, the red cross to show Bound away in the dreadnought to the east and we go Bound away, bound away Where the stormy winds blow Bound away in the dreadnought to the east and we go There's a health to the dreadnought and her jolly crew Likewise, Captain Samuels and the officers too. You may speak of your packet, red line and black ball, but the red knot is the packet that can outsail them all. Bound away, bound away, where the stormy winds blow. Bound away in the red knot to the east we go. Bound away. to the